order. Questions to the Prime Minister. James Morris. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. James Morris. Thank you, Mr Speaker. In the black country, in the West Midlands, we are very proud of our long industrial heritage. We are also very proud of the recent revival in the fortunes of the black country with new jobs and investment in the local economy. Would the Prime Minister agree with me that one of the ways to create an economy that works for everyone is to further devolve powers and funding to the West Midlands to drive investment and to combine that with the strong leadership and vision that only Andy Street can provide yeah, yeah, yeah. Conservative candidate for West Midlands Mayor? Right, right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My honourable friend speaks up well for the, uh, for the black country, and I'm pleased to echo his comments about the economic growth in the West Midlands. Since 2010, we've seen over 220,000 more jobs in the region, 55,000 more uh, new businesses in the region. But he's right. The devolution deal is important. It's the biggest it's, uh, the, uh, uh, deal that, devolution deal that is being done for the West Midlands. Part of that is crucially the election of a directly elected mayor. And I think Andy Street, with both his local knowledge and his business experience, will drive economic growth. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I start by welcoming the child refugees that have arrived in Britain in the last few days? They're obviously deeply traumatised young people, and we should welcome them and love them and support them in the best way that we possibly can. Uh, Mr Speaker, irrespective of party, when members of this House go through health problems, we reach out the hand of support and solidarity and friendship to them. Uh, I just want to pay tribute to the member for Grantham and and Stamford for the social media message he sent out this morning. It shows amazing humour and bravery, and we wish him all the very best and hope he fully recovers from this. Mr Speaker, there are now to be regular sessions of the Joint Ministerial Council to discuss Brexit, but it seems the Prime Minister's counterparts are already feeling the same sense of frustration as members of this House. The First Minister for Wales, Carwin Jones, said there is a great deal of uncertainty, but they are clear they need full and unfettered access to the single market. Can the Prime Minister help the First Minister of Wales and indeed the other devolved administrations by giving them some clarity? Well, first, first of all, can I commend, in response to the comments that the Right Honourable Gentleman made, can I commend the Home Office for the work that it has been doing in ensuring that it is working carefully to look at the best interests of the child refugees so that they are provided with the support that they need when they come here to the United Kingdom. Can I also join him in commending my honourable friend, the member for Grantham and Stamford, for being willing to be so open about the uh, uh, health problem that he has, and we wish him all the very best for the future and uh, for his place here in this House. In relation to the issue of clarity on the aims that the Government has has uh, in relation to Brexit. Uh, I have been very clear and I will be clear again. Uh, the There are, those, there are those who talk about means and those who talk about ends. I'm talking about ends. What we want to see is the best possible arrangement for trade with and operation within the single European market for businesses in goods and services here in the United Kingdom. Jeremy Corbyn. I thought for a moment the Prime Minister was going to say Brexit means Brexit again. Um, there are others... Uh, I'm sure, I'm sure she'll tell us one day what it actually means. Um, the Mayor of London also added this is causing unnecessary certainty, but it's also very important. <laughs> uncertainty. Um, Mr Speaker, it would be also very helpful if the Prime Minister could provide some clarity over the Northern Ireland border. Will we continue membership of the Customs Union, or are we going to see border checks introduced between Northern Ireland and the Republic? The the Leader of the Opposition uh, tries to poke fun at the phrase of Brexit means Brexit, but the whole point is this. Brexit, it's this Government that is listening to the voice of the British people. 
uh, Brexit means Brexit. That means we're coming out of the European Union. What the right honourable gentleman tries to be doing is frustrating the will of the British people by saying that Brexit means something completely different. Now, in relation to the Northern Irish border, uh, a considerable amount of work was already going on with the, uh, taking place with the Irish government to look at the issues around the common travel area. That work is continuing. We have been very clear, the Government of uh, the Republic of Ireland have been very clear, the Northern Ireland Executive has been very clear that none of us want to see a return to the borders of the past. And I would simply remind the Right Honourable Gentleman that the I would simply remind the Right Honourable Gentleman that the common, the common travel area has been in place since 1923, which was well before either of us joined the European Union. Jeremy Corbyn! Mr Speaker, on Monday the Prime Minister said the customs union was not a binary choice. Well, I can't think of anything other than a binary choice is whether you have a border or you don't have a border. There isn't a third way on that one. Um, on Monday, her friend, the Honourable Member for Broxtow, expressed concern of the automotive and aerospace industries, while the British Banking Association said its members are poised, quivering over the relocate button. Every day the Prime Minister dithers over this chaotic Brexit, employers delay investment and there are rumours circulating about relocation. This cannot carry on until March of next year. When is the Prime Minister going to come up with a plan? I have to say to the Right Honourable Gentleman, I think the fact that he seems to confuse a customs union with a border, where they are actually two different issues, shows... Yes. Shows, shows why, shows, shows, shows why it is important that it is this party that is in government and dealing with these issues, and not his. He, he talks about the plan. I've been very clear. Uh, I've been very clear that we want to trade freely with the. In, both trade with and operate within the single European market. I want this country. I want this country to be a global leader in free trade. The Labour Party is against free trade. I want to introduce, I want to introduce control on, on uh, free movement so that we have an end of free movement. The Labour Party wants to continue with free movement. I want to deliver on the will of the British people. He is trying to frustrate the will of the British people. Well, Mr Speaker, there was no answer on the border, which was the question. And uh, on, on Monday, Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister told the House, and I quote, we have a plan which is not to set out at every stage of the, uh, every stage of the negotiation the details. I've been thinking about this for a like, couple of days, Mr Speaker. And I think... Uh, when you're, searching, when you're searching for the real meaning behind, and the importance behind the Prime Minister's statement, you have to consult the great philosophers. The only one I can come up with... Mr Cleverly, calm your health, yourself. You're imperiling your own health, man, which is a source of great concern to me. Jeremy Corbyn. What I can come up with, Mr Speaker, is Baldrick, who says... <laughs> Our cunning plan is to have no plan. <laughs> Brexit, was, Brexit was apparently about taking back control. But the de devolved governments don't know the plan. Businesses don't know the plan. Parliament doesn't know the plan. When will the Prime Minister abandon this shambolic Tory Brexit and develop a plan that, deve that delivers for the whole country? Yeah. I'm interested that the Right Honourable Gentleman chose to support Baldrick. Of course, the actor playing Baldrick was a member of the Labour Party, as I recall. Yes. I'll, tell, I'll tell the Right Honourable Gentleman what we're going to deliver. We are going to deliver on the vote of the British people. We are going to deliver the best possible deal for trade in goods and services, both with and operation within the European Union. And, uh, and we're going to deliver our, an end to free movement. That's what the British people want, and that's what this government's going to deliver for them. Yeah. Mr. Jeremy Speaker, Gordon. three years ago, the United Kingdom backed Saudi Arabia for membership of the UN Human Rights Council. 
On the 28th of October, there are elections again for the UN Human Rights Council. A UN panel has warned that Saudi Arabia's bombing of Yemen has violated international law. Amnesty International says, and I quote, executions are on the increase, women are widely discriminated against, torture is common, and human rights organisations are banned. So will her, government, will her government again be backing the Saudi dictatorship for uh, membership of that committee? As the Right Honourable Gentleman knows, where there are legitimate human rights concerns in relation to Saudi Arabia, then we raise them. In relation to the action in the Yemen, we have been clear that we want those, uh, the uh, incidents that have been referred to to be properly investigated, and we want the Saudi Arabians, if there are lessons to be learned from those, to learn lessons from those. But I will reiterate a point that I have made in this House before, that our relationship with Saudi Arabia is an important relationship. It is a particularly important relationship in relation to the security of this country and counter-terrorism and foiling activities of those who would wish to do citizens' harm here in the UK. Enemy Corbyn. Mr Speaker, Tahir Qasim, a Yemeni man who lives in Liverpool, told me this week that Yemen is quickly becoming the forgotten crisis. If people aren't being killed by bombs, it's hunger that kills them. The UK needs to use its influence to help the people of Yemen. Bombs exported from Britain are being dropped on Yemeni children by Saudi pilots trained by Britain. If there are war crimes being committed, then, as the UN suggests, they must be investigated. Isn't it about time this government suspended its arms sales to Saudi Arabia? The issues are being investigated, I say to the uh, right honourable gentleman, and we have taken action. He's right to refer to the humanitarian crisis in the Yemen, uh, and this country is one of those that is uh, in the forefront of ensuring that humanitarian aid is provided. That is a record of which I believe that this country and this government can be proud around the world in terms of the actions that have been taken. It is important. There was a cessation of hostilities in the Yemen, which was for a period of 72 hours over the uh, the weekend. As I have referred to in this House on Monday, I spoke to the Crown Prince of uh, Abu Dhabi at the weekend, and one of the issues we discussed was the importance of trying to find a political solution in Yemen and seeing, if possible, that that cessation of hostilities could be uh, be continued. It has not been continued, uh, but we are very clear that the only solution that is going to work for the Yemen is actually to make sure that we have that political solution that will give stability in the Yemen. Mr Christopher Choke. Mr Speaker, 20 years ago, a Conservative government agreed that Christchurch and East Dorset councils could retain their sovereignty, independence and control over their own destiny. <laughs> Honourable friend, assure the House that the Government will not agree to the abolition of Christchurch or East Dorset councils against the will of my constituents. My, my right honourable friend. My right honourable friend is right to speak up for his uh, constituents, and he's also right that there isn't a single model that is going to work in every part of the country. That's why we believe it's important for local people to come together and to determine what is right for them. I know my right honourable friend is trying to build a consensus in Dorset as to what the right way forward is. I think it's right that local people are able to respond to cons- the consultation and that their concerns are listened to. Angus Robertson. Yeah. Thank you very much. The Scottish Poppy Appeal is launched today for parliamentarians, so can I take the opportunity to praise all of the fundraisers, the volunteers and the veterans involved, and I'm sure colleagues in other parts of the House will commend efforts to raise money for the Poppy Appeal in the rest of the United Kingdom uh, as well. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, one of the biggest humanitarian catastrophes of our time is in Syria, specifically in Aleppo, where we expect a ceasefire to end shortly and an onslaught to begin. Will the Prime Minister tell us what efforts the UK is currently undertaking to support a peaceful resolution to the conflict, but also to deal with those who are exacerbating the situation? Well, first of all, may I join the Right Honourable Gentleman in commending and praising the work of all those across the whole of the United Kingdom who give their time and efforts to raise money for the Poppy Appeal. It is very important that we never forget those through many conflicts 
who have uh, given of themselves for the safety and security of us. Uh, and it is important that we recognise that and give generously to the poppy appeal over the, uh, over the United Kingdom. In relation to Syria, of course, it is important to approach this in a number, in a number of tracks. We are involved, my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, has uh, been involved in discussions with the uh, Amer United States Ameri uh, Secretary of State Senator Kerry about these, uh, Secretary of State Kerry about these uh, particular issues, looking for that way forward. I raised the issue of Russian uh, actions in Syria, uh, particularly the bombing of Aleppo, at the European Union Council at the end of last week. It was only on the agenda because the UK had raised it. And as a result of that discussion, the EU agreed that should the atrocities continue, then we will look at all available options for taking action to put pressure on Russia to stop their indiscriminate bombing of innocent civilians. Angus Robertson. I commend the Prime Minister for, for those uh, endeavours, but it's widely expected that the onslaught on Aleppo will be unleashed by Russian air power, which is currently steaming across the Mediterranean aboard the Admiral Kuznetsov and its battle group. In recent years, more than 60 Russian naval vessels have refuelled and resupplied in Spanish ports. Whoa. So will the Prime Minister join me and EU and NATO allies in unequivocally calling on Spain to refuse the refuelling? Yeah. The, the uh, right honourable gentleman refers to the passage of Russian naval ships and of course on the, uh, on the high seas they are able to travel as they wish, although of course when they went through the English Channel they were accompanied by uh, Royal Naval vessels as they, uh, as they went through. Uh, but the, the, what we have seen, sadly, is that the Russians are already able to unleash uh, attacks on innocent civilians in Syria. What matters is that we put pressure on Russia to do what everybody agrees is the only way that we are going to resolve this issue, which is to ensure that we have a political transition in Syria, and that's where we should focus our attention. Wendy Morton. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mr Speaker, my constituency of Aldridge Brown Hills forms part of the new West Midlands Combined Authority, and so there will be new powers being devolved to the authority and the mayor. Um, can the Prime Minister tell me how these new powers will help my constituents and local businesses in sectors such as manufacturing, the automotive industry and bricks and ceramics? Yeah. I, I can confirm to my honourable friend that the deal that is being proposed will provide the West Midlands with £1 billion over 30 years to spend on local projects that will drive economic growth. And this, I think, is the important part of the deal. It's why it's so important to have a mayor who understands the local area but also has business expertise, Andy Street, to ensure that those economic projects are being developed with the interests of the locality in, in uh, the prime focus for them. I believe that the deal will deliver more jobs and economic prosperity across the West Midlands. It's good for the West Midlands and her constituents. It's good for the rest of the country as well. Yeah, yeah. Helen Hayes. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The independent inquiry on child sexual abuse was established to deliver long-awaited justice for victims and survivors, and to do so, it must have their confidence. The Shirley Oaks Survivors Association represents more than 600 survivors of abuse which took place in Lambeth Council-run children's homes and has recently raised serious concerns about changes to the inquiry. Will the Prime Minister meet with me, the Honourable Member for Streatham and representatives from the Shirley Oaks Survivors Association to discuss their concerns and take action so that confidence can be restored? Yeah. The Honourable Lady makes a very important point. Uh, the whole purpose of this inquiry was to be able to provide justice for those whose voices had not been heard for too long and who felt that people in positions of power and institutions of the state and other organisations had not heard their voice, had not been prepared to listen to them and to properly investigate what had happened to them. It is important that victims and survivors have confidence in the inquiry. Of course, the inquiry is an independent inquiry and it is up to the inquiry chairman to ensure... to. Uh, work with survivors and victims, which I know the inquiry chairman has uh, been doing. But I will certainly ensure that the Home Secretary has heard the representations that the Honourable Lady has made, and we will take the, what she has said to us today away and consider very carefully what she said. We all want this inquiry to work properly and to work in the interests of survivors and victims. Yeah. Anne-Marie Trevelyan. Yeah. 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 Prime Minister will be aware 
declare that our nation's commitment to our present and former armed forces personnel and their families by way of the armed forces covenant is a work in progress and that whilst we have made important moves there is still much more to do. Will she take this opportunity to assure this House of her personal commitment to the values and promises set out in the Covenant and pledge to lend her support to efforts to continue the good work begun to ensure personnel, veterans and their families face no disadvantage for the service and sacrifice they have all made for our country? My my honourable friend is absolutely right and I know she has championed the Armed Forces Covenant and is a great proponent of of, uh, our veterans and the armed forces. And it is absolutely right that everybody in this House should owe a great debt of gratitude to our veterans and to those who are serving today in our armed forces for what they do to keep us safe and secure. And that's why it's so important that the Covenant isn't just a responsibility for the Government, actually it's a national responsibility. We should all be working to ensure that that, that those who have served us and served us well uh, do not face disadvantages. It's why we We've been doing things like putting money into a forces help to buy scheme to help them with houses. I think the figure is 200 million, uh, and we must continue to do this. And I absolutely uh, commit to ensuring that this is a government that continues to support our veterans and the members of our armed forces. Turner, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, last year my 25-year-old nephew Matty committed suicide after a very short period of depression. His GP had referred him for talking therapy counselling, but warned him he'd be at least six months before he got an appointment. Mr Speaker, these treatments in the NHS are very often um, a a waiting game and a dangerous waiting game and a postcode lottery. What's the Prime Minister doing to sort this crisis out? Can I first of all... uh, recognise and commend the Honourable Gentleman for raising the personal experience that he has of of, uh, the terrible uh, tragedy that can occur when mental health problems are not properly dealt with. Uh, He raises a very serious issue, and it's a serious issue for everybody in this House, uh, on how the NHS treats mental health. It's why we have established this concept of parity of esteem for mental health and physical health in the National Health Service. It's why we are seeing record levels of funding. But the question of talking therapies, which are uh, therapies which are very effective, um, and uh, we have been introducing waiting time standards in relation to talking therapies, but I accept that there is more for us to do in this area to ensure that those with mental health problems are properly treated, are properly uh, uh, given the care and attention that they need. It is an issue not just for them, it's an issue for the whole of our society. So David Amos. My right right honourable friend became Prime Minister in dramatic and extraordinary circumstances and in my judgement she has proved more than capable of rising to the many challenges It was not my right honourable friend's fault that the Chilcot report took seven years or more than £10 million in terms of costs. Now that we know that Parliament was misled, would my right honourable friend reassure me that she has a cunning plan to ensure that action is taken? I thank my, uh, I thank my honourable friend for his, uh, his, his comments. Uh, It was, obviously, what the Chilcot report did was an important task, but although it did look at and criticise the way in which information had been handled in a number of uh, aspects, it did not say uh, that people had set out deliberately to mislead, and I think it's important that we recognise that. But it is important also that we learn the lessons from the Chilcot report, and that's why the National Security Advisor is leading a piece of work and exercise to do precisely that. This was a long time coming. It was a serious report. There is much in it. We need to ensure that we do learn the lessons from it. Dr Alistair MacDonald. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Question six, please. No, just get in there, man. Let's hear it. Sorry. The the Prime Minister will be aware that much of the foundation and many of the elements of the 1998 settlement and peace agreement in Northern Ireland was referenced and rooted in EU approaches and processes and laws and that leaving the EU will significantly destabilise the foundations of that settlement. Has the Prime Minister given any consideration to the extent of the potential damage the EU withdrawal 
from the European Union could do to that Good Friday Belfast Agreement and the 1998 political settlement? And does she at this stage have any plan to protect that settlement? Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, I I don't believe there's any reason to believe that the outcome of the referendum will do anything to undermine the absolute rock-solid commitment of this Government and the people of Northern Ireland to the settlement that was set out in the Belfast Agreement. And there is and remains strong support for the entirely peaceful future for Northern Ireland. Uh, That has been determined by democracy and consent. We remain committed to that, and we remain con- committed to work with others to ensure that entirely peaceful future. Jeremy Lefroy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. General Electric has started, has shown its confidence in the UK economy and my constituents by starting construction of the second of its two new world-class research and manufacturing facilities on Staffordshire County Council's Red Hill Business Park. Would the Prime Minister meet with General Electric and other West Midlands manufacturers to hear just how important supply chains and markets, free of tariffs and bureaucracy, are to them and their hundreds of thousands of staff? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm delighted to hear of the commitment that GE has made to Stafford. But it's more than a commitment to Stafford, of course, it's a commitment to the United Kingdom and to the future of our economy here in the United Kingdom. I understand that my right honourable friend, the International Trade Secretary, has already met with GE to discuss with them their interests in trade and what we can be doing to promote free trade. As I've said earlier, I want the UK to be a global leader in free trade, and we are listening to businesses around the country in the importance that they place on free trade as we look at uh, the negotiations for exiting the EU. Jim Dowd. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Speaker. Is the Prime Minister aware of the recent reports showing the continuing and alarming increase in average alcohol consumption in the UK, and particularly amongst women. Given the numerous health risks associated with excessive alcohol consumptions, will her government, together with the drinks industry, re-examine the case for mandatory health warnings on all alcoholic products? Well, I I recognise the uh what the Honourable Gentleman raises in terms of the figures that have been shown recently and particularly the figures in relation to women and uh, the use of alcohol. Of course, I was uh, part, as Home Secretary, part of the development of the alcohol strategy that the Government produced a few years ago. And I'm pleased to say that at that time we were working well with industry to encourage them to ensure that they could take steps to to have an impact on the uh, the drinking habits of the nation. Maggie Throop. Thank you, Mr Speaker. With the final decision on the eastern route of HS2 Phase 2 imminent, it is imperative we invest in new road infrastructure to support the additional traffic that this will bring to the areas around the new station hubs. Yeah, yeah. With this in mind, will my right honourable friend back my campaign for a new Junction 25A of the M1 to ensure that Erewash residents don't get stuck in a jam? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I seem to recall I first met the, uh, my honourable friend when she was campaigning on an issue in relation to, uh, to motorways. Um, and she's absolutely right that in order to support the rail infrastructure, we need to make, ensure that the right roads infrastructure is there. And that's why we're investing £15 billion in the road investment strategy. That's about boosting local economies and boosting growth and seeing further uh, economic growth. I understand Highways England are looking at the issues uh, in the East Midlands. They're looking at bringing forward significant significant new road enhancements around the expected site of the new East Midlands HS2 station. Uh, And going forward, they're looking at an audit of roads in the area, and I trust that my honourable friend will make her voice heard on this issue and that of her constituents, as she has done in the past. Alison McGovern. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I return the Prime Minister to the answer she gave to my friend for Hull? Because the Conservative manifesto promised shorter NHS waiting times for those who need help with their mental health. But as prescriptions for antidepressants still rise, my constituents in Wirral, who need talking therapies, have to wait a month for referral and well over four months for treatment. So was that Tory manifesto just words, or will the Prime Minister ever deliver? I I gave a serious answer to her honourable friend, which is that we have been looking at the whole issue of talking therapies and the availability of talking therapies and the waiting times that relate to uh, talking therapies. And we do want to improve 
the uh, options that people have for having access to talking therapies, precisely because they have been shown to be so successful in so many cases. So this is something that the government is working on, and we will continue to work on it to provide, as we have said, that parity of esteem between mental health and physical health in the National Health Service. Stephen Hammond. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As a former Wimbledonian, my right hon. Fed will understand the significance of transport for South West London and, in particular, for Wimbledon. Could my right honourable friend assure me that the government still supports Crossrail 2 and will she ask the Secretary of State to set out the timetable for the delayed consultation? Well, I can absolutely give the commitment that we continue to support Crossrail 2. We're waiting uh, to see a robust business case and uh, a proper funding proposal in relation to Crossrail 2. My right honourable friend, the Transport Secretary, I think will in due course be setting out what the uh, timetable in relation to this is. But I can assure uh, my honourable friend, as a former Wimbledonian, that we are well aware of his interest in the Wimbledon to Waterloo uh, aspects of this, uh, and the needs of the local area are are being taken into account. Yasmin Qureshi. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, in the Indian occupied Kashmir over the last three months, 150 people have died, 600 blinded by deliberate use of pallet guns, over 16,000 injured, many critical, unexplained disappearances, food and medicine shortages. Yeah. Will the Prime Minister meet with me and cross-party colleagues to discuss the human rights abuses and the issue of self-determination for Kashmiri people as was set out in the resolution of the UN in 1948. And can she raise this matter with the Indian Prime Minister? Extremely grateful to the Honourable Lady. The Prime Minister. Well, the Honourable Lady sets out uh, her case and the, the issues that she's identified in relation to this. We've taken uh, the I take the same view as this government has uh, since it came into power and indeed uh, previously, which is that the issue of Kashmir is a matter for India and Pakistan to deal with and to sort out. But the Foreign, the foreign Secretary has heard her, reputations, uh, her representations and I'm sure will be interested in taking those issues up with her. Jack Presti. Thank you. Yeah, right. Thank, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Several months ago I raised the issue of enhanced medical assistance for the Kurdish Peshmerga with the former Prime Minister at his last PMQs. I then wrote to the new Prime Minister. But now with the campaign to liberate Mosul ongoing, will my honourable friend agree to meet with me and representatives of the Kurdish regional government to discuss if we can provide specialist medical facilities here in the UK, for instance 10 beds for seriously wounded Peshmerga, and to ensure that the forces on the ground are getting all the support they need, because I understand they are short of heavy weapons and basic infantry kit like helmets and body armour. Well, the, the, my honourable friend is right, and I recognise this is an issue that he has raised before. And I would just first say, obviously, what we have seen is that the coalition activity that is taking place is actually having some impact and is having an impact as uh, we wish it to in relation to Daesh. Um, there aren't uh, plans at the moment either to uh, undertake to do what he has suggested in his question or to provide uh, a field hospital and field medical uh, capabilities uh, from the United Kingdom, but we do continually review what we are doing in terms of support of the, uh, of the coalition. And of course, we are also, as part of the training that we are uh, providing for the Peshmerga, that does include training in the provision of medical facilities. Owen Thompson. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm sure we all recognise the removal of the camp at Cali is not a long-term solution to the ongoing humanitarian crisis. But can the Prime Minister tell us what the government is going to do to learn from the experiences in Cali and to speed up acceptance of vulnerable individuals as it committed to under the Lord Dub scheme? Yeah. Uh, individuals are already being brought to the United Kingdom under the Dubs Amendment. That's in addition to the resettlement scheme for vulnerable uh, Syrians that we have, the 20,000 that will be brought to the UK over the course of this Parliament, and in addition to the 3,000 vulnerable uh, people, children and others who we will be bringing from the Middle East and North Africa, working with UNHCR and all of these to, to make sure that it is right for the individuals to come here to the United Kingdom and that they have the support when they uh, get here. But I would remind
remind the honourable gentleman that it is this country that is the second biggest bilateral donor in relation to humanitarian aid in the Syrian region, and we are able to support and provide for more people in region. And I think that's absolutely the right thing to do. Natania Mathias. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Around Heathrow, <coughs> air, legal air quality limits have been breached. Over Twickenham, noise pollution has increased. That's according to Heathrow data. Can the Prime Minister explain how a third <coughs> runway can be delivered and comply with pollution legal requirements? Does she agree environmentally Heathrow is not good enough and cannot possibly be both bigger and better? I, the uh, government looked very closely at this issue of air quality and environmental impact of all three schemes that were proposed by the Airports Commission. We took extra time to look at those. That was from the uh, decision to take increase airport capacity in the South East. We wanted to look more particularly at the air quality issues. The evidence shows that air quality standards can be met as required by all three of the schemes, including the North West Runway at Heathrow. But my honourable friend raises an issue that is actually about more than airports, because the question of air quality is also about road transport. Uh, and that's why we are uh, looking to do more in relation to the, what we're doing uh, for air quality. It's why, for example, I'm pleased to see that we are at such a leading edge in the provision of electric vehicles. Al Williams. Speaker, the Prime Minister's real plan for Brexit seems to be to pick winners, to cut a special deal for the City of London, to let the bankers avoid the dire consequences of leaving the Economic Union. An economic, uh, has an exporting economy with a £5 billion trade surplus last year and 200,000 jobs dependent on trade with the European Union. A soft Brexit for her friends in the city, a hard Brexit for everyone else. Will she cut a similar deal for Wales? I will be cutting the best deal for the United yeah. Kingdom, all parts of it. George Freeman! Every year, hundreds of people are diagnosed, suffer and usually die prematurely from rare diseases like cystic fibrosis and rare cancers, for which there has been no treatment or for which the latest drugs are prohibitively expensive. This week has seen the final report of our Accelerated Access Review, which sets out a new model for the NHS to use its genetic and data leadership to get quicker access and discounted prices. Will the Prime Minister uh, join me in welcoming that review, which is strongly supported by patients, charities and the life science sector, and in encouraging NICE and NHS England to implement it speedily? Yeah. Well, I, I certainly join my honourable friend in welcoming the publication of the review. This is important in terms of patients being able to get quicker access to, uh, to drugs and treatments. Um, it is, I think, the United Kingdom has established a leading role in relation to the life sciences. I will pay tribute to my honourable friend for the role that he has played in, in uh, developing life sciences here in the United Kingdom. I know the Department of Health will be looking very closely at the specific uh, recommendations from that report, um, but will be doing so in the light of recognising that if we can take opportunities to, uh, through the National Health Services to be encouraging the development of the new drugs in the benefits of patients, that we should do so. Luciana Berger. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the, the Prime Minister just told us that there are record levels of spending going into our mental health services. Her Health Secretary stood at that dispatch box on the 9th of December and told us that the proportion of funding going into mental health from every one of our CCGs should be increasing. Why is it then that 57% of CCGs in our country are reducing the proportion of spend in mental health? Yet another broken promise. Where will we have real equality for mental health in our country? Well, the, the fact that I set out that we're spending record levels uh, in the NHS on mental health is absolutely right. But I have said in response to a number of people who've questioned on this that we recognise that there is more for us to do in mental health. And I would have thought that we should have cross-party support on doing just that. And wait, Lee. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Speaking outside 10 Downing Street on the day she became Prime Minister, my right honourable friend said, if you suffer from mental health problems, there's not enough help to hand. Can I welcome my right honourable friend's commitment to mental health expressed on that day? And in her responses today, what steps she is taking to make sure the bold ambitions of the government's five-year forward view for mental health are achieved. Yeah. Well, 
I'm, I'm pleased to say that, in fact, what we see, far from some of the comments, the impression that's given by some of the comments opposite, is that since 2009-10, around 750,000 more people are accessing talking therapies, and 1,400 more people are accessing mental health services every day compared to 2010. So that's up by 40%. But my, my honourable friend, who I know has a particular interest in this issue and a particular expertise in this area, is right that we need to do more and that's why we are continuing to invest in mental health services and continuing to increase the standards that we provide. Finally, Mr Greg Mulholland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Just 20 children are diagnosed with inoperable brain tumours as a result of tuberous sclerosis every year and yet despite earlier indications, NHS England turned that down for funding despite being affordable. Will she meet with me? the Tuberous Sclerosis Association and families to discuss how we can get through this blockage and get the treatment that these children need. I'm very happy to look at the issue that the Honourable Gentleman has raised uh, and look in detail at what can be done to take that forward. Order.